The Minds in Motion podcast from Dementia Researcher, in association with the NIHR Applied Research Collaborations and Alzheimer's Society, showcasing exciting new research and the work of the DEMCOM Fellows. Hello and welcome to the first episode of Minds in Motion, a brand new podcast series from Dementia Researcher. Every day this week, we've got five researchers who will take it in turn as show host and they'll interview uh, one of the other four. And all of this will be overseen by our permanent anchor, the brilliant Trevor Salomon. Today, we start by hearing from Dr. Megan Rose Reedman from University of Liverpool, who's going to talk to, to us about her work on the relationship between hearing loss, Parkinson's disease and dementias. Hello, I'm Dr. Neil Chadbourne, and I'm a Dementia Community of Practice Research Fellow at NIHR Applied Research Collaboration East Midlands. I work at University of Nottingham, and I'm delighted to be here to host the very first show in this new series. I work on intergenerational st storytelling using digital technology to support sharing memories for South Asian community. However, you'll learn more about me in the last show of the week. But for now, let me introduce my co-host, Trevor Salomon. Many thanks, Neil. Hello, I am Trevor Salomon. I'm an Alzheimer's Society volunteer, and I'm also vice chair of the European Dementia Carers Working Group. My passion and involvement is driven through the time I've spent as a full-time carer for my wife, Yvonne, who was diagnosed with young onset Alzheimer's disease in 2013 when she was just 57. Since 2019, when she became doubly incontinent and I could no longer recharge my batteries, she's been living in a care home and very well looked after. Through this podcast series, we will be hearing about some of the incredible research being delivered as part of the Dementia Communities Fellowship Programme, or DEMCOM for short. This is an NIHR Applied Research Collaborations and Alzheimer's Society Partnership which promises to deliver the next generation social science research leaders. Let's meet our very first guest, Dr. Megan Rose Reedman. Hi, so thank you very much for having me today. Really looking forward to being here. So I am Megan. I am a postdoctoral research fellow in the Applied Research Collaboration based in the Northwest Coast. Um, so prior to this position, I was a ESRC funded postdoc fellow and I was looking at the relationship between hearing loss and Parkinson's disease. And I'm now kind of developing that work, looking more at atypical types of dementia, specifically Parkinson's dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies. But I'm sure we'll get into that in a little bit more detail soon. We definitely will, Megan. Mm -hmm. So you've given us a top liner about what your research is. Can you tell us a little bit more about it in some detail, please? Yeah, for sure. So some of you may have seen there's been quite a lot of evidence that's come out over the last sort of 10 years that is suggesting that hearing loss may be a potentially modifiable risk factor for dementia. So what that essentially means is that having a hearing um, impairment may increase the likelihood of someone later going on to develop dementia. Um, so this body of evidence is quite robust. There is quite a lot um, in terms of volume. But what this sort of body of evidence really lacks in is it considers dementia as a whole. So what we really don't know is whether hearing loss is a risk factor for all types of dementia or whether it's specific to different types of dementia. So, you know, when these studies have been using big databases, as we know, Alzheimer's disease dementia is the most common type of dementia. It may be that hearing loss is only a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease dementia, but not the other more rare forms of dementia like Lewy body dementia or Parkinson's disease dementia. So what we're kind of trying to do and what I'm trying to do in this project is sort of unpick this picture a little bit more and look at whether hearing loss is influencing the likelihood of somebody going on to develop dementia 
in these rarer subtypes um, or whether it is just, you know, something that's related to Alzheimer's disease, dementia. And the other thing that I'm also sort of hoping to look into is we know loads about, you know, like the statistical relationship and all this. But what we don't really know is actually how it's impacting people living with dementia. So, you know, how does a having a hearing loss and dementia actually impact their lives? Does it does it make things more difficult and things like that? So I'm also doing some um, data collection and some interviews to try and unpick a bit more as to how hearing loss may actually impact people on a day to day basis. So um, I'm really interested in the links there between uh, potentially between Parkinson's disease and and, and dementia. And and uh, I wonder whether uh, you're, you're sort of hinting that hearing loss may be, be part of that link. And I wonder if you can tell us a, a bit more about, for example, non-motor symptoms of, of Parkinson's. Uh, explain that a bit more. And, and is hearing loss linked to that? Yeah, so there is some evidence. Um, there's literally only three papers out there, one of which is actually my work. But there is some evidence that suggests that hearing loss is a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. So it's predating the motor manifestation of um, Parkinson's disease. But really, again, kind of as I've alluded to, all this body of literature that looks at hearing loss in relation to both, you know, all cause dementia but Parkinson's and rare forms of dementia tends to focus in on the statistical big data relationships so we haven't actually been able to unpick how it's related to the non-motor symptoms for example um so we don't really understand that in essence but what we are seeing say from like my public engagement work, for example, and some of the interviews we've started, we are kind of starting to see that some people are suggesting that having a hearing loss, um, it, it's, it's making it more difficult for people to have like clarity of thought, for example. Um, and obviously you can understand that having a hearing loss may affect sort of like your balance or your walking. But those more nuanced sort of relationships in terms of clarity of thought and hallucinations are right at the beginning that we're starting to tease apart. But there is a very long way to go, I must admit. Megan, what um what drew your interest uh, in terms of this study, uh, the relationship between hearing loss and atypical dementias? If I'm quite honest with you, Trevor, it is um a personal reason. Um, so my partner's mum was diagnosed with Parkinson's in her 40s it transpired that she actually had a more aggressive form um, of uh, multiple systems atrophy so that's kind of where the draw comes to look at Parkinson's and Parkinson's related disorders um, but in the broader picture what we see every day is there's so many so many amazing exciting pieces of work going on in the dementia sphere but a lot of those do really focus in on sort of Alzheimer's disease dementias and the more you know well known types of dementia and unfortunately if you look at the the landscape and our understanding of dementias you've got like a really great understanding of Alzheimer's up here but our understanding of you know like Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's dementia is you know, right down here in comparison. Um, so that kind of drives me to want to focus in on that to level it up and sort of bring our understanding and our knowledge of those rarer types of dementia up because, you know, Lewy body dementia is the second most common type of dementia outside of Alzheimer's disease dementia. So it's it, it's really important for us to reflect on Um so yeah, it's dual reasons, um, sort of, I'd say. Yeah, no, I th I wondered if there might be a personal reason and <laughs> uh, and thank you for sharing that. There often is in research, isn't there, if you've been touched by something? Yeah, definitely. And I think it, it, it is really important for us to reflect on that and how that may be influencing our practice as researchers. It definitely, you know, like from those experiences, um, 
it makes you think of it in a different way, um, which is really great, but there may also be drawbacks to that, you know, like the emotional side. So it's just to acknowledge it definitely. And it definitely makes me more passionate, shall we say. Maybe following on from that, um, we're talking about the impact of, of hearing loss. Um, maybe you can say a bit more about uh, whether uh, your patient and public involvement consultation or or views from participants in your studies it, you know what what kind of um comments and, and experiences have, have they shared with you yeah so the as you mentioned neil the patient and public involvement has been absolutely central and if we take it way back to actually the start of my esrc postdoc fellowship it was a really off the cuff blase comment that i had um from somebody who lives with parkinson's that that got me ticking and thinking about hearing loss in this context. In the first instance, this individual just passively said, oh, when I go to my support cafe, you'd be hard picked to find someone not wearing a hearing aid. Mm. And I was like, hmm, okay, let, let's unpick this. Let's have a, let's, let's see a little bit more and have a chat about it. So that individual actually, I'm really, really grateful and fortunate has been part of this research journey from from that comment up until today, which is really fantastic. Um, so yeah, we've been kind of drawing from um, different lived experiences throughout. Um, so I'm in the process of writing up a protocol for like a big quantitative analysis and two people who live with Lewy body dementias and one person who cares, well, previously cared for someone with Lewy body dementia, have been consulting on what measures they think are really important for us to include. So, you know, um, they've been giving advice like, oh, make sure you include a hallucination measure, make sure you include this. So they really, these individuals really have shaped that proposal and completely guided where we go with it and reflecting on their personal experiences as to how hearing has, their hearing loss has impacted them, has really driven the way we're looking if I'm honest with you yeah Megan thinking about what you just said and in, in terms yeah. of the number of people turning up at clinics wearing hearing aids yeah what are your insights on either genetic or environmental factors that may link hearing loss with these types of dementia yeah I, this is really 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 great question and something that we need to be really um focusing in on so unfortunately, as it stands right now, we don't, there is no evidence um, for us linking congenital hearing loss to dementia. Unfortunately, the data is just not there. Nobody has followed, um, you know, infants right up to the age of at which they would potentially show um, dementia. So everything that I would mention is hypothesis driven, not necessarily data driven but there are kind of like a few reasons why we think hearing loss may be related to dementias and one of those things is um sort of based on a neural pathology which may like you said Trevor be related to genetics it equally may not be but there may be some sort of genetic influence there Alternatively, it could be an influence from the environment, like neurotoxicity, for example. So like toxin exposure or whatever is inciting these neural chemical changes that we then see, which may independently lead to hearing loss and dementia. Um, but like I said, this whole body of research is very much, you know, we're, we're still finding our feet. We're in its infancy. There is no firm conclusion that it's genetic or it is environmental. But if you look at the literature, I think people would be more swaying towards, you know, environmental influences. So some of the hypotheses purely rest on social interaction, for example, you know, if you have a hearing impairment, you might withdraw from society because it's really difficult for you to engage in conversations. And in doing that, you know, you may end up um, not using the cognitive functions, which then may lead for them to become impaired. Sort of if you don't use it, you lose it situation. Um, so, yeah, 
like I said, the, the, the evidence, the data isn't there yet. So we're really hypothesis driven and we're just trying to feel it out. But it does, I would assume, or I would, from my perspective, say, if anything, it's going to be a genes and environment interaction, but the environment definitely can't be ignored in that circumstance. I wonder if I can bring it back to the sort of practical uh, yeah. aspects that in, in yeah. some ways, uh, but also talk about uh, some some potential collaborations and, and different professional perspectives. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, it's an, it's an interesting um, mix of, of two different topics. Obviously, we, we know that uh, dementia is, is the psychiatrist's domain. Um, Parkinson's is likely to be uh, addressed by geriatricians, um movement um focusing on on movement primarily uh so that's sort of two different elements of the health service uh that that patients may find themselves in um so i wonder if that shapes their experience and what services they receive and then how you might contact and and collaborate with those two um slightly different perspectives of of sort of physical health and, and, and mental health on, on the other hand yeah so what we tend to see is most people who live with parkinson's parkinson's dementia or dementia with Lewy bodies are primarily seen by a neurologist um, and that tends to be the specialism so we're currently collaborating with neurologists at the walton center mersey care and in greater manchester um there but like you've already highlighted, Neil, this, it's such a fragmented experience for people who are living with these specific um, types of dementia that it's really hard. And this is one of the things that, you know, not personally myself, but I know other people are considering is where would hearing fit in that space? At, at what point would the audiologist be brought in um, to provide support for the individual living with um dementia so in this sort of next phase of research that I will be coming into hopefully soon maybe not but you never know um we are hoping to bring together audiologists neurologists and um, movement disorder specialists and you know bring everyone together to sort of figure out a little bit more about what needs to be done to support these people and where it's best placed for the support to occur um People, like you've mentioned, people who live with Parkinson's um, see their neurologist, I mean, it is quite infrequently, but, you know, um, more frequently than anyone else. So for Parkinson's, it may be better placed there. But somebody who lives with Lewy body, for example, they may be slightly seeing a different group of people more frequently. So if they went to clinic with memory complaints before the movement problems they may be more associated with the memory clinic for example so it's it's really difficult and it, it may be that we have to address it differently for different circumstances and that's one of the main things that's kind of underlying everything that I'm looking at I want to basically like the big picture to, is to look at whether we should be addressing hearing loss in the concept of dementia in the same way for every type of dementia or not, which I know is an absolute logistical nightmare for the NHS, but you know, <laughs> we can try. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I can just follow that up then with a uh, question about sort of theoretical framework. Is 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 that, you know, are, are you um, considering or developing some theory that, that links these, these two sort of specialties or, or, or two areas of knowledge? Yeah, so the theoretical framework we are working within links back to kind of what I was mentioning um, to Trevor before. But the, yeah, there's four main hypotheses as to how hearing loss may be related to dementia. Um, I won't bore you with going into them because they're, they're, they're very long and complex. Um, but yeah, they, those are the core theoretical frameworks that we link back to. Um, and it's... Uh, if if I'm honest with you, when like you know, when you look at the research that's considering hearing loss in the context of dementia, it's probably maybe like five to ten years behind the research that looks at other aspects of dementia, for example. So we are very new. We're treading 
unknown waters as to where like what services should be involved and where it should be involved should it be a primary care issue is it a secondary care issue we don't know and unfortunately when I do speak to people who live with these types of dementia it really does appear that it's not it, it's not an issue that's dealt with in primary or secondary care people end up having to go private it's what the situation is now it's not people aren't um using services provided by the national health service they are going private to have this issue addressed unfortunately can i bring you back to my yeah, personal yeah. situation and uh I know this conversation is mostly focused on Parkinson's disease, dementia and uh, Lewy body dementia. Yeah. But as I said in my introduction, my wife had Alzheimer's and there came a point in the progression of her Alzheimer's where I thought she was losing her hearing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I then started to do some reading about this and I, I read about something called the cocktail party syndrome. Mm -hmm. And what I realised was she wasn't losing her hearing, but her Alzheimer's was preventing her from concentrating on multiple conversations. So I'm just wondering in your research, if you've, uh, if you've looked at interventions for hearing loss after diagnosis. I haven't personally got to this step yet because we're still working on the primary evidence. There isn't any evidence looking at Lewy body in this um, field, but a really, really big deal famous um, professor has started to look at whether providing somebody with a hearing aid actually um, reduces cognitive decline and helps cognition in people who live with dementia. Very, very early evidence. It was literally launched at AAIC last year the, at the preliminary findings. And they are somewhat promising. So they do, these findings do suggest in some individuals, having a hearing aid may reduce the cognitive um, decline but I stress some individuals. The analysis showed that this, in, this intervention was only beneficial for people of ethnic minorities and low socioeconomic background. So people who already potentially have quite a high risk burden for later dementia, the hearing uh, treatment is providing some benefit, but to people who may potentially have a lower risk burden, the hearing intervention wasn't having quite the same effect. However, that is not to say that a hearing aid isn't beneficial for somebody living with dementia, because obviously what we do see, and the evidence is way stronger and way more compelling in this direction, but we do see if we give people who are having memory um, complaints a hearing aid, their increase in their social engagements, um, getting out and about and doing more things, which obviously is a massive benefit in terms of quality of life. You know, it doesn't always necessarily have to be about slowing cognitive decline. If it's going to help them in terms of socialization, that's still a benefit, right? Yes. Um, but it may not necessarily be that the intervention of putting in a hearing aid does reduce cognitive decline, which then links back to the hypotheses that may potentially suggest that the two are related on a neural level rather than an environmental level. Yeah, I know somebody who's been living with Lewy body dementia for a number of years. Yeah. I think I'm right in saying he's just had a cochlear implant and mm -hmm. his world has been positively transformed by it. The hallucinations have stopped, he's sleeping better. And he's like a transformed individual. Exactly, yeah. And that's exactly what I've been hearing when I've been speaking to people. They've been saying, oh, all of a sudden, everything's just easier. Yes, you know? I think he used that word, actually. Everything's just easier. Yeah, yeah. So even if it's not potentially slowing cognitive decline, if it's helping someone, then it's a win, surely. I mean, yeah. Oh, hopefully. definitely. <laughs> yeah. Megan, you've, you've told us some... Some of your big ideas and, and future <laughs> directions uh can you tell us a, a bit about your next steps over the next few months over the next few months i'm hoping to collect all this primary evidence um we did have plans and hope to use um large-scale databases and um, but unfortunately these large-scale databases don't actually code Lewy body dementia mm. which is a nightmare so we can't use those sorts of things. So the plan over the next few months is to really 
hone in and crack on with the collecting of the primary evidence. Um, and again, as, as I've said several times to you, Neil, always, always, always keep talking to people who live with Lou body dementia. You know, I, I want to hear stories, the good, the bad, the ugly, not just cherry pick things that fit with our ideas. So any any opportunity that we can have to speak to people about this sort of thing as well is top priority over the next few months. Just thinking about what you said there, Megan, uh, has any of your work involved you collaborating at all with the Royal National Institute for the Deaf? That's something that we're working with at the minute. Um, so we're trying to build a collaboration with um, the colleagues at the RNID. So, um, yeah, to hopefully produce some sort of information booklets and things like that for people who live with dementia. We haven't actually had the opportunity to collaborate with them just yet, but it is, it's a goal. I really want to. And <laughs> I will keep trying nonetheless. Um, but yeah, that's 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 definitely the way we would like to. Because obviously, as I'm sure you'll both appreciate, if somebody is living with a hearing impairment and has dementia, they're not only going to go to the Alzheimer's Society for support, for example, they may also go to hearing um, charities and things like that. So we do need to be ensuring that both um, dementia-focused charities, but also hearing loss focus charities have equal support for those individuals. Well, thanks, Megan. We've, we've uh, been really interested in, in your uh, research and future direction. Uh, but now we'd like to move on to uh, hear a bit more about your career development and uh, tips to, to other uh, researchers in, in the field. Okay, thank you. So these are supposed to be quick fire questions, although I'm, I'm sure the answers might be longer than, than we anticipate. But Megan, here's the first one. Could you share your journey towards this post and this field, please? And what were the key decisions and experiences that guided you to this niche? Undergrad psychology um, at Lancaster University. You'll see the common trend. Masters in psychological research methods at Lancaster University. Um, I did a PhD in clinical cognitive neuroscience at Lancaster University. And then I did my first postdoc with the Economic and Social Research Council at Lancaster University. So you can see I was kind of born through the system at Lancaster, didn't really vary too much. Um, in terms of key things that made my decision to go into the niche, it's if I'm honest with you, it's definitely got to be Sam and the family experience there mm. that's pushed me into that um, niche. And if I'm honest with you, I, I can say standing here right now, I won't ever plan to leave that niche because of those connections. Thanks. Throughout your career, what have been some of the significant challenges that you've faced in, in your research and, and academic development? And uh, maybe you can say how you've overcome some of them. I definitely think my biggest um, thing that I've struggled with is <laughs> perfectionism um, because in the world of academia, you can just keep going and keep going. Nothing is ever perfect. You could completely drive yourself insane and go forever. Um, and the sage advice I received from my PhD supervisor once is sometimes some things just have to be good enough. And it took a very, very long time to get there to realise, you know, like those forms of the admin doesn't need to be publishable manuscript quality or whatever. Um, but yeah, and it, it, it's it's acknowledging that it, it's no indication on you and you shouldn't be hard on yourself. And sometimes some things deserve more time, effort and energy than other things. But that was my big issue, if I'm honest with you. Well, it's a slightly longer question for you, demanding a short answer. For someone looking to enter the field of neurodegenerative disease research, particularly focusing on the sensory aspects like hearing loss, what advice would you give regarding education, skill development and research opportunities, Megan? In terms of going into ne neurodegenerative research, um, it's incredibly supportive field um, I've found massive support from colleagues at conferences and networking events 
And in terms of when th you're thinking about um, different sensory processing, there is a lot of commonalities between them all. So say, for example, my PhD focused on visual perception, and now I'm focusing more on auditory perception, and those skills are very transferable. So if you were to work as um, in, in a domain that's looking at visual processes, that doesn't mean that you can never go into audiology, for example. There, right, there is a lot of overlap um, there. We do see in this sort of field, a lot of um, researchers are, you know, audiologists by trade. That was their first degree. We see a, a load of that or ophthalmologists, ophthalmologists, anything um, in terms of sensory sort of clinicians, shall we say. Um, but yeah, there is there is overlap. Theories, und fundamental un underpinnings do overlap between the sensory um, domains. So there is definitely possibility to switch between different sensory processes. So uh, maybe a, a, an easier one. What's the single most important thing you've learned from your fellowship so far? Collaboration is key and to acknowledge your weaknesses is somebody else's strength and you don't necessarily have to then go away and do all the research in the world to become skilled at that just collaborate with someone two heads work better than one you can bounce ideas off each other the like our fellowship offers the most perfect opportunity to collaborate with people in different fields from different walks of life and it really comes into light and shows that you don't have to be an expert at everything. Collaboration is absolutely fantastic. That's what teamwork's all about, isn't it? Everybody has strengths, everybody has weaknesses, but together you're brilliant. And yeah. so I think I like that word collaboration. Exactly. It's like the concept of the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Exactly. It's... So we've we've covered the really serious stuff. Um, <laughs> we thought we'd like to end with some fun questions for you, Megan. So here's the first one. If you could time travel to any period in history, when would you go to to share your knowledge about dementia and why? I think I'd probably go a few years ahead of now, because what we're starting to actually see now is some quite concerning trends in younger people in terms of their noise exposure, for example. So we see a lot of younger people. I mean, I have some need to talk. I've got headphones in right now. But we see a lot of younger people blasting the music through their headphones, going to loud concerts. It's not cool to wear earbuds, but it's safe and it's beneficial. So we do have concerns that hearing impairments and hearing problems are on the rise. And if this relationship between hearing impairments and dementia stands, then that's really quite concerning. Um, so I think... Yeah, a few years from now or even now, it's it's really important given the societal changes in younger people's behaviours in terms of their hearing. Believe it or not, I was young once and I wouldn't have listened to and I didn't listen to any advice anybody gave me when I was younger. So how are we going to break through and make people understand that, you know, bombarding their hearing with too much noise is potentially going to give them some health problems later on? And I don't just mean hearing loss. Exactly. I think... It is a real difficulty and I think we have to look to what influences younger people. So I have two nephews, my oldest nephew, he's a teenager and I know the things that influence Leo are like social media, online engagement. So we do need to be looking to these influencers, whatever you want to call them, because if we do want to incite long-term system change in younger people's behaviours, we need to go with what's what they like. Um, like they don't want to listen to the teacher at the front of the room because it's not cool. Yeah. But that person on TikTok is the bee's knees. So that's all. But yeah, I, I'm not volunteering to be a TikTok influencer. But talking about uh, linking with, with other people, if you could collaborate with, with someone in your dementia research and, and this someone was a fictional character, which, which fictional character would you choose to work with? Okay, you know Belle from Beauty and the Beast? Obviously, she spends so much time like reading books and searching for knowledge and not taking things on surface value. So when she meets the beast, she doesn't take it on the surface value and be like, oh, that's a horrible creature. She digs within and sees underneath and takes away the facade and looks 
deeper within and I think in the terms of the research that I'm doing with that you can't just look at the big picture the facade that faces you 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 really do need to dig within to unpick things um so probably her and because it's Emma Watson so I'm afraid that's all we have time for today but I'll be back tomorrow and we'll be joined again by Megan, this time taking over as host. If you want to learn more about this topic or the DEMCOM programme, visit the Dementia Researcher website where you will find a full transcript, links mentioned in the show and much more. I would like to thank our incredible guest, Dr. Megan Rose Reedman. I'm Trevor Salomon. And I'm Dr. Neil Chaplin. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Bye bye. You've been listening to the Minds in Motion podcast from Dementia Researcher in association with the NIHR Applied Research Collaborations and Alzheimer's Society. To learn more about the DEMCOM programme and to get all the support you need, visit dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk and don't forget to like and subscribe.